Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, m and Bank, The Wickoff Group, Chelsea Lighting, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Liumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Eric Feinstein, LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, New Banks, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orphanides, Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis, Red Apple Group, Barglin Weiner & Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Popular Community Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American and these friends. So they call it the borough of Queens. It's the most diverse population. It's probably the second largest in population in the city. It's growing by leaps and bounds. So today I've assembled these individuals who will talk about all different aspects of what's happening in the home of the city field, New York Mets, Queens. My guests they include Steve Chen, who is the executive vice president at Crystal Windows and Doors. David Brouse, who is the president of Brouse Realty and also the president of Long Island, Business, uh, Long Island City Business Development Corp. Uh, Jeremy uh, Schell, who is the executive vice president for uh, planning and development for TF Cornerstone. And last but never least, Michael Meyer, who is the president at F&T Group. So we have here today, we have a person who owns property in Queens and it also manufactures. Manufacturers, understand, New York City is still manufacturing a product, doors and windows, and I mean mostly windows, but that's a great thing. David is a owner of property, but he's also exceptionally involved in Long Island City. He owns a building where JetBlue just relocated. Jeremy is part of a major development over here of how many five, fourth 5,000 units on the water side? Uh, 3,000 apartments. 3,000 3, apartments. Michael over here is involved with Flushing. So what's happening in Flushing? Because, you know, this, when I went to visit you in July, I was so surprised to see all the developments and so many people and everything. Well, Flushing, the phenomena continues. Uh, the state controller issued another report again about uh, economically how it's outperforming really most of the rest of not just the city but the state. And... Um, I think a couple of years ago we talked about it. I believe it's really a phenomenon of, of immigration. And particularly as with the ascendancy of uh, Asia, uh, Flushing is a critical bridge to Asia for the United States. Flushing now, uh, the Asian population is about 60 percent. Um, it now um, really is uh, larger than uh, Chinatown. Even. Now relating to that, you, you're, you're in College Point, but you're really in Flushing. Mm -hmm. How many people work at Crystal? We have close to about 300 employees, uh, give or take 10 percent, depending on and, the season. And where do they live, and where do uh, majority lives in Queens and uh, Northern Queens too? And how many would you say live in the Flushing area? I would say a good uh, 70 percent live. Now, how how hard is it for you to get quality and skilled employees to be there? Not too difficult. We're, we're, it's a manufacturing plant, so we're looking more for blue collar uh, uh, workers. A lot of the immigrants that, that we've tapped into and, uh, and to the staff, and to, especially in Northern Queens, they do have existing skills that they've brought in from Asia or, or, or South America. Um, but it's been, it's, it's been a great labor pool. Northern Queens, uh, man, the manufacturing sector is so strong out there, and uh, 
there are we have multiple applicants almost every day. Now it's interesting, you know, you talk about the the labor structure and the manufacturing. Uh, the, the Browse family, how many years do you, do you own the building where JetBlue is today? I bought it in 1980. 1980. So in 1980, which is mm -hmm. 33 years ago, we looked at a, a a market that there was really manufacturing in the Long Island City. Sure. Today, how much is manufacturing in Long Island City today? There's still a nice, vibrant uh, industrial core in Long Island City, uh, uh, right off the Midtown Tunnel, really. Uh, you've got great trucking access, you've got great public transportation, uh, you've got still a very good uh, tax program that the city is trying to incentivize manufacturers, industrial companies to stay in the five boroughs and specifically in in this Long Island City, southern Long Island City area. When we bought the building in 1980, it was all garment manufacturing. Uh, Fast forward probably 15 years after we bought it, mid-90s, the garment manufacturers had moved out of not just Long Island City, but moved out of New York, had moved to Mexico, had moved to Southeast Asia, and moved to lower cost places to do business. The writing was on the wall. What do you do with the building? You start converting it to other uses. Right, but when you were originally planning to convert it, you were planning to convert it to a, a tech building, if I right. remember. Right, we talked about Bridge Plaza Tech Center, and uh, you've got a good memory. And so this was the, the tech bubble, and uh, we were all excited about people coming out with uh, redundant sources of power and uh, gas, water, et cetera. Uh, the fiber backbone coming right over the 59th Street Bridge, this was going to be primed for that. Lo and behold, tech bubble popped. MetLife, thankfully, uh, net leased the entire building from us, uh, about 700,000 square feet. Uh, and then JetBlue then followed up with a uh, about a 300,000 square foot sublet of the building to move their headquarters in. So you went from garment manufacturing, before that it was you know carriage and automobile manufacturing, right. to garment manufacturing, and now you've got you know very very high income people that are working there and making you know major decisions from Long Island City with the same great access to public transport, same great access to Midtown Manhattan and uh, the subway chains that we've got There's there. There's no great. bad transportation from Flushing, right? Flushing's a transportation hub. We got 20 bus lines. The number seven line ends at Main Street. It's the 10th busiest in the entire city. I think the busiest outside of Manhattan. You have the Long Island Railroad. You have the highways. So it's a transportation hub. Let's talk about how TF Cornerstone entered Long Island City and what, what they've been involved with over the last decade. Sure, yeah. Um, well, we were early entrance into the redevelopment uh, or, or the uh, emergence of the residential market in, in Long Island City. We have a, a master plan called uh, East Coast. Uh, it's on the waterfront. It uh, sits on over 20 acres of land that when Which once was the Pepsi-Cola. Uh, once was Pepsi-Cola, among other uh, uses in, in the past. Uh, we had a massive environmental cleanup. It's clean, and we've uh, since completed now five of seven buildings that sit on there, and we're finishing up the last two. Our, our next building to start leasing will start in the spring, and we'll, that'll be an 820-unit building, and then the final uh, building. Where are the people from? What are the age... Right. Aged people, uh, and what's what do you see moving to this section of Long Island City? Yeah. Well, look, I think Long Island City in general is uh, you know younger than the, the the general population of Manhattan. We're growing faster than Manhattan. We're uh, you know generally more affluent uh, on average. Uh, uh, and what you're seeing though uh, is uh, very clear is the m there are more families moving into the area. Uh, relative uh, to what the but general families population. moving in, and, and, and this relates to all of Queens and New York City. People will move in, but education is important. How are the schools today in Long Island City? That's part of the story. I mean, we're building, we're building the right mix uh, to attract uh, the families that are getting basically pushed out or are looking for more space or more amenities or just better quality of life. But uh, there's all the amenities that are being built uh, within our complex and around our complex, not only by us but uh, by the city. Uh, we have a new K through 8 school going in uh, in the East Coast Master Plan. That's uh, about 600 students. And that'll be open up in the fall down the street as part of Hunters Point South, not too many blocks away from our buildings. There'll be a new high school. I think that's about 1,100, 1,200 students. Uh, that'll also be opening up this fall. You have a library that's going to be about 22,000 square feet, all, all within short walking distance from our, uh, our, our master plan. So I think it really attracts the uh, the families. Not, not but we lost the tennis courts. I mean, we, lost remember, we used to have a lot of the tennis courts. We lost tennis there, courts, right? But what we're you know we're building a 55,000 square foot amenity uh, center on this next building, which is going to have two tennis courts. 
You know, so 55,000 square feet. Of just amenity space. Now, what about, where are your customers? I mean, where, where, where are your customers? Are they domestic or are they around the country or you know, locally? Crystal, we ship to 35 states. But um, 65 to 70 percent of our business are all New York City-based customers. Uh. So with regard to that, how much of the business would you say is in Queens? We were talking prior to the show, and you said you, you, you're building a number, you, you're supplying the windows for a number of new hotels. Are Correct. they in Queens, or are they in the five boroughs? Um, they're mostly in the city. On a, um, not too much in Queens. Uh, we do have some projects in Long Island City, uh, but most of our larger scale hotel projects are all based in Manhattan. Who, who's your competitors? Our competitors. I mean, is it the Pellers of the, the world or their, uh, the, cr the Skylines or all of them? Um, yeah, they, they, they are our competitors also, but they also focus on different markets. Um, our, the fact that Crystal is very diversified, we have over 16 different product lines. So we could, we could uh, do a project for replacement windows and also new construction work. Uh, Pellers and the Andersons out there, they're mostly wood window products and residential uh, products. But we offer from vinyl to a high-end architectural rated aluminum project. Uh, I, I just recently finished uh, the, the, the former penthouse unit for Frank Sinatra's apartment on the east side, uh, I think around the 70th Street area. And then we could do a high-rise building such as a 50-story a, a hotel in the city. Well, what's more interesting is the fact that we, we still, when people would not believe that we're manufacturing windows in Queens. I mean, that's, I think that's part of the phenomenon over here. I mean, let's talk about flushing in other parts, Willits Point, and so on. You have a major project. Talk about this project, which has many people would say it's taken a number of years. Yes, our flushing commons project. And when Mayor Bloomberg was first elected, uh, uh, downtown development uh, plan was put in place by Dan Doctoroff, and some major initiatives. The redevelopment of the flushing uh, municipal parking lot, 1,100 spaces, was put out for RFP tender. We combined with the Rockefeller Development Group, 50-50 partners. We won the RFP. Uh, it's heavy with community benefits. We have one acre uh, public plaza, YMCA, 62,000 square foot YMCA, mixed use. Um, but it's, it's taken some time given the downturn. It's so large scale. It's almost two million square feet. Of and, wh and what are you going to build first? Uh, we are now, um, we've revised the project to phase it. So the first phase will be first office condominium, which is very strong in, in uh, flushing owing to the strong medical office. Well, which is very interesting. I mean, TF Cornerstone is into you know, other businesses and you're in the, uh, in the office business. The office condo market has really not made it in New York because many people have always said that it limits expansion. Now, in Flushing, it has a different category because the Asian community likes to own. Goes to your opening question about Flushing. The Asian community does like to own. Um, part of the phenomena with the growth is that 75% of the uh, growth there are for small businesses with under five. I, I mean, people would be A lot of doctors. It's a medical right, center. You know, people would be surprised but that you were telling me when we, we took our little walk about there that the, the restaurants are owned as condominiums, mm -hmm. and, you know, which is a total surprise. You know, especially since you have tenants over there, you never hear of a restaurant owning it. Mm -hmm. But it's you know the Asian community liking the ownership of of owning the piece. Our, our project that's opening in a year, one Fulton Square, has a hotel, but the, has medical office. It has uh, residential condominium retail, all being sold. I and I believe you're on the board of uh, New York Hospital Queens, also. Correct. Which is in Flushing. Yes. So now. Let's talk about the, the hospitality industry in Flushing uh, and in Queens. You're building this Hyatt Place. Now, Hyatt Place is, what would the, is that a three and a half star? Or what would be uh, a three? It's, um, I think it's, it competes with uh, the Hilton Garden Inn. Um, it's of that caliber. Hyatt, I think, I think it's, a, it's sort of the, the top of its Right, class because of the Hyatt name. And the Hyatt name. This would be the first Hyatt in Queens. Um, and it's across the street from the Sheridan, which is a full service. Hyatt Place is not a full service hotel. As part of a mix, this is part of a mix. And you're having a rooftop, and like everything else. We have a, we have a rooftop. Mean, a rooftop. We will have, I think, probably certainly Flushings. I don't know about Queens. I don't know about your projects, but this will be a, a rooftop uh, a bar. And now you were saying in your prop, one of the properties you own in Queens, it's called the Q. The Q4. Q4. And what is that? 
Uh, it's a combination. I mean, you're the landlord. You're, right. you're not the operator. Uh, we have an operator that uh, we brought in. Uh, it's a combination of hotel and youth hostel. You have a lot of uh, people that are coming around, uh, you know, kind of the old backpacking. You went around Europe and you went from bunk bed you to bunk bed. You didn't see my pack? I had it in the, in the green room. Absolutely. Uh, so they come in and they don't want to spend $300 a night on a hotel, full service hotel, even limited services hotel. Some of the people that are coming to New York City and they want to be here for a week. Limited service becomes out of their price point. They come in and for $59 a night, they're sharing bathrooms, they're on a bunk bed, but boy, they're in New York City. They're one stop away from uh, Midtown Manhattan and they're you know saving enough money to be able to afford to come to New York City. We've got a huge number of tourists that are coming here and they it becomes very unaffordable. Um, so if there's a way for New York City to build more very, very low priced uh, hotels and hostels, that's a, a real benefit for the city. Here's an interesting question. Where are, you know, and I, I, I briefly asked the question of Jeremy before, where are the people coming from who are relocating to different parts of Queens? Mm -hmm. Where are the people, and I, you're planning to build a residential tower in Queens also, uh, not in their location, but where are the people coming? Because when I've done shows, when I've had over here, Denny and other people, we said people are coming from all over around the world to come to New York City. Yep. They want to be in Manhattan. Who's coming to Queens specifically? Uh, I mean, and what's the difference in pricing? Because if we were talking part of the show that basically you can get a brand new apartment in your building maybe at 48 to $50 a foot. A brand new apartment in Manhattan and some of the properties that you own would be $90 a square foot for the apartment. So the savings is so much. And as David alluded in his comments, you know, being the promotional agent for Long Island City in Queens, it's just a subway token away. It is. Okay, and it's not a token, a metro card. Away. Metro card, right. But so where are these people coming from? And where are the people coming from? Flo I'd like Jeremy to... Yeah, um, I, I think the answer is they're coming from uh, several pockets. I mean, first, we're like I mentioned earlier, we've got a lot of families coming being that are by choice or being forced out of Manhattan due to pricing, looking for space, looking for amenities. So we have a big population of families moving in. Uh, we also have uh, the younger demographic that um, that is looking to either save money or also have the amenities. So we have people coming from Manhattan getting pushed out. We also have people that are not commuters into Manhattan but are commuting uh, out to Long Island or other areas of the boroughs uh, and have found this as sort of a, a more central location close enough to Manhattan uh, but you know they're getting the benefits of proximity to their job as well as the ac access to Manhattan. So we're seeing it from both ends but uh, you know it's, it's a obviously a different population then you're going to see uh, populating other areas of, of Queens and, and um, sort of the outer boroughs. <coughs> In order for a place to be a 24-7, you need retail, you need industry, you need some hospitality. Retail, you know, you go to Forest Hills or certain parts of Queens, you know, Queen Center, it's, it's great. But retail in Long Island City uh, is, is really a little slower. Uh, what... what, what what do you see happening in the growth? Do you see, can, do you, a Whole Foods perhaps or a Trader Joe's? I mean, you have the, the semi-equivalency in a smaller scale in your place. Yeah, I think we have a great, I mean, it's a great supermarket. And, it's, and, uh, and, my, and from my perspective, retail has arrived in, in, in large part in, uh, on Vernon Boulevard in, in uh, closer to the waterfront. Probably you can talk about Court Square, but it's arrived and it's only getting stronger because what often happens with these sort of emerging residential markets is the residential comes first and the retail follows, and the retail is following and, and it's actually playing out. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Jeremy's totally right that it, it really starts with the residential. So the industrial, that was more of a nine to five, that didn't really encourage the retailers to come. When the industrial started getting replaced by the residential and now the hotels, now you're really seeing 24-7 activity there, seven days a week. It's not just the JetBlue and the MetLife. So you've got people on Queens Plaza now countless hours of the day. Uh, it followed the higher end residential. So you're starting with the river, you've got the supermarket, you've got the Dwayne Reeds, you've got the really nice restaurants on the river and now on Vernon Boulevard. Now you're starting to move them up Jackson Avenue. Now you've got between so, Rock so, Rose so. And, uh, and others, you've got thousands of units being planned between Court Square and so, Queens so, Plaza. So here's my question, you know, Queens is, is larger than this. We have Bayside. If you had to expand, which I hope you are because of the amount of business you're doing, where would you expand in the New York market? Would you, do you have expansion space where you can over here? Or? We're losing expansion space, um, manufacturing expansion space. Uh, we are looking at other states. Why are you losing uh, manufacturing expansion uh, space? It's, the cost is just too high uh, to, to look for manufacturing space. We even offer 
acres, uh, 20 acres in eastern Pennsylvania for for three million dollars versus three acres here for thirty million dollars. It's it's the, the the spread is just too far. But, but what about the workforce? The workforce we could always find blue collar workforce uh, um, to 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 staff our factories though. Uh, now, but it's not what just if, space, but, it's but what if, what if, too. you know what part of the way that we do growth in New York City, and and. The TF Cornerstone is definitely an example, and uh, Michael with f and and every and he worked with Tishman Swire before, uh, is that the city creates incentives, okay. okay? The city has created incentives for Crystal originally, mm -hmm. so do you see the city, in order to keep the, the people here, you have to do this, okay? You don't want to lose the manufacturing. I mean, we lost the apparel manufacturing years ago, uh, but it's really important that we have a, you know, a, a door and window company, you know, out there and people like you over there. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're saying the costs are that prohibitive. Yeah, it's getting very prohibitive. Um, I just don't think there's any more property. There's no more corporate procs and industrial corporate procs left. Um, we did look at some locations in Southern Bronx um, and their industrial parks, but just, just the space, I mean, not just the space, but Running a factory, you need a nicer square, rectangular type of building. We can't really find a square, rectangular type of building to fit all our needs on it. Um, not just uh, the, the cost of the property, but electrical costs. Uh, we're paying about 17 cents per kilowatt hour. When you go out to, to our St. Louis location, seven cents per kilowatt hour. Um, there's, there's advantages here, you great highways, like you brought up, the, we're right next to the Van Wick. Uh, the highway systems in Queens, I think, are the best compared to all the other boroughs. Uh, we, we're, we're right in the, we have two major, two of the three major airports are located right in Queens here. Um, but however, no matter what, it's property for expansion, it's, it's just running out mm. here. Uh, David, do, do, do you see any, I mean, since you, your family business has been around, you're the third generation over here uh, for many years. Do you look at other, do you think there are other markets in Queens that are a place that you'd want to build or develop today? Sure. Uh, you know, when we look at Manhattan, which is where the bulk of our holdings are, it's become priced, you know, out, out of the stratosphere. You've got pension funds, you've got all these foreign uh, entities coming in and saying, we want to own in Manhattan and we need that picture of the trophy building in Manhattan, and they're paying three cap and four cap rates. That's not us. So when we look at where the, the growth markets are, Long Island City's starting to get a little pricey. So you start going east, you go Willits Point. I mean, the city is gonna be dumping a huge amount of money and in investment and credits to see that area get built. Uh, I like Flushing, I like Jamaica. Let's, let's talk about Willits Point. Willits Point today is the home of City Field. Nothing else, okay? A couple of auto dealers, and not dealers, you know, auto mechanics places. Flat and so, picks. Okay, <laughs> flatbeds and other situations. What's happening? I was with, you know, Claire Schulman I ran into last week, former borough president who's involved with the Willits Point marketplace. There's talk about a, uh, a soccer team. Do you think that'll happen? I don't know enough about it, but it's a big issue politically with Parkland. Is there any more uh, space? Because it sounds like, you know, uh, after your development, can you build? I mean, there are certain things they're trying to work on the Long Island Railroad, I think, in well, Flushing, and they're doing certain other developments. We're the largest landowners in Flushing, and we have other holdings along the river next to the old, now the U-Haul building, the old zipper building. We have several acres along the river. And by the way, the LDC is looking to rezone all that land on that river because that's really serves like the Berlin Wall between Flushing and Willits Point. And what will they, so and what will they rezone it for? Um, uh, more residential, less uh, um, C44 is what they're looking at. You know, one of the interesting situations that has happened in New York is that people have been utilizing the ferries a great deal. Right. Okay, have, what about in Long Island City? Has yeah, L Long Island City's ferry I isn't as successful as it can be. I, that's largely a function of the fact that there's construction going on in Hunters Point South and the, and the location of the ferry terminal there. Um, it, you know, it, it, it sort of um, impedes traffic. Yeah, because, the, uh, you know, the, the speed and the time will... It could be very successful if they would have, if they'd move the, the, ter the, the ferry stop to the right location. And ultimately, we'll, we'll be successful uh, when that, the rest of Hunters Point South gets developed out and it's easier for people to access what, the stuff. What about, do you think we'll have f uh, ferries from Flushing? You know, uh, your friend and mine, Joe Ficalora, is a big believer in that. And I think ultimately when that area that I'm talking about gets redeveloped, 
the city zoning requires a reinstatement along the water waterfront in some park. I think it's possible. Now, even though it's it sits on Queens, we have a property called Roosevelt Island, which is not Queens. But I believe that with what's happening with the Technion Cornell situation, it's going to help everybody in the entire market. It's going to help the entire borough of Queens. And as Ophir Denny said to me on a panel recently, it's going to help him on 65th Street and 2nd Avenue because right. people are going to take the ferry. And I believe that's going to be a, a major effect the, for you to build new properties because in the same manner that you have the apartments in Roosevelt Island, they service Cornell Medical Center and Sloan Kettering Memorial. Sure. You, you've got Cornell Technion building a, a wonderful technology campus there for grad students coming in from all over the world. But it's Manhattan, They're, remember that. You can't you can't grow from that campus, so you have to either grow east or west. If you grow west, you're in Midtown and Upper East Side of Manhattan. You can't afford that. So you grow east, you're into Astoria and you're into Lyon City. We think there's going to be a huge amount of growth of tech companies looking to kind of spin off of that campus, plus student housing and you know off-campus housing. Yep. That'll be a great, great neighborhood. Mike, there is also key to unlocking another great opportunity for the city, which is Governor's Island. They've just come out with an RFP again, mm -hmm. and they've suggested that the ferry, ferry service is the key to making See, if, that if work. you if you want visionaries, it's the TF people. I mean, they they went to the West Side, they went to Lower Manhattan. So, th so if there's any opportunities for new growth. Uh, the the family, right. <laughs> Fred and Tom will be there, no question over there. How hard is it uh, for you to gain additional incentives to, to try to build additional buildings or anything in the city? I don't know about building uh, additional uh, factories. Uh, I guess I'm competing with you three in a way also because I'm also always looking for manufacturing space. <laughs> um, but but to get incentives, uh, it's there's a lot of local agencies, uh, and, 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 uh, Queens Economic Development Corporation, the local, uh, the city's EDC, um, ITech. They've been able to help look for incentives. It's just it's just to uh, make the right connections and do a lot of research to find incentives. Incentives uh, in Long Island City. Uh, you still have some sites we were talking about earlier that have 421A benefits that are stalled development sites that if some construction was done, you still have the ability to have 421A, which makes rental apartments much more affordable. Um, you do still have some incentives that the Lyon City bid and, uh, and partnership are trying to keep industrial companies in, in Lyon City in that core. But if you look at where Mayor Bloomberg and city planning are putting their emphasis, they're putting it on higher technology, higher income earning jobs, less on manufacturing, in more maybe on specialty manufacturing. So the garment district, they want to keep a core garment district, but not for huge amount of garment manufacturing, for the specialty piece that needs to be done in midtown Manhattan to get to the to the show five minutes later. So I, I think, you know, in essence we, we've got a, we, we've seen a lot of things happening in Queens and we've also discussed the, a variety of developments and I'm happy that we had a manufacturer today <laughs> to talk about it and to see what happens. I'd like to thank Steve Chen uh, David Browse, Jeremy Shell, and definitely Michael Meyer for all being here, and I'll see you next week.